So I'll come back to this a uh, little bit controversial uh, component of this behavioral discussion uh, about whether uh, there is a cognitive and cultural arms race and whether that uh, leads to enhanced social selection. So that's as opposed to genetic selection. So I, we use adaptation here. So this uh, particular article uh, that I have cited down here looks at uh, cognitive, affective and cultural adaptations and enhanced social selection. Uh, well, we said before that adaptation is genetic and adaptability is behavioral, developmental, anatomical, and uh, so on, linguistic, whatever. Uh, nonetheless, I'll include this just for a brief introduction. I am not an expert on this, and uh, you definitely should read the paper to make sure you understand the nuances of their uh, uh, arguments. So here is choice trait coevolution. How we choose whether it's cognitively affective is mood, attitude, uh, can be psychological disorder as well. So it's uh, feelings and uh, so on. Uh, yeah. So uh, cultural, of course, is that if you belong to a particular country, a region within a country, a religion and so on, it can lead to certain choices uh, very clearly. So, uh, is there an arms race happening and whether that leads to cultural selection? Of course it does in many ways, but in terms of behavior, what does it actually mean? So, uh, competitive uh, trait, reciprocal selection, uh, so increased social cognitive weaponry, so how it divides us, for example. Uh, in terms of partner choice, uh, choice and expression of reciprocity, altruism traits, so ability to help uh, others without expecting benefits. Uh, this is again the question is whether that's uh, behaviorally uh, stable, econ evolutionarily stable and there is something called reciprocal altruism which is slightly different where you keep helping people uh, expecting that they will return the favor but you don't always wait for it you just kind of keep doing it and you get enough back that you are happy doing it many people do that uh, we have the instinct to be helpful but uh, not infinitely and we often expect things back right so that could lead to enhanced longer-term cooperation within groups uh, altruism is always considered uh, good cooperation and there are some cultures which very strongly encourage uh, altruistic behavior either feeding the poor through your religious organization and uh, donating blood and so on and so forth. In terms of mate choice, choice and expression of cognitive pair bond traits. So here you are going a little bit beyond uh, just uh, reciprocity and altruism traits. You are looking for cognitive pair bond traits so it can lead to enhanced female male cooperation and child rearing whether your marriage is happy stable and so on but of course uh, these depend on many details like whether a uh, female is uh, financially independent which means whether she's educated and whether she's a feminist or whether she belongs to traditional thinking of uh, what she considers a female's role is in uh, family and so on and so forth. Offspring choice, choice and expression of offspring fitness value traits. These are implicit and explicit choices people make uh, while selecting mate for example, can lead to enhanced social, uh, child social and cognitive development uh, and then cultural selection uh, includes cultural complexity, learning and co-evolution leading to uh, enhanced culture and social cultural learning. So there is increased between group competition and increased within group cooperation uh, leading to cognitive and cultural arms races when you have a competing group. Okay, so this is not a typology, but these are the various components of how this can work. So just 
use it for what it is, which can lead to enhanced social selection and cognitive affective cultural adaptations. Happens a lot with migrations. Uh, I went to the US when I was uh, very young and lived there for majority of my life. Uh, learned many things other than education, culturally, socially, linguistically, uh, diet-wise, uh, travel-wise, uh, preference-wise, and so on. And then now I'm back in India. So uh, what does that mean in terms of my uh, cognitive and cultural uh, adaptations, uh, affective behavioral changes and so on and so forth. Okay, So with that, uh, there is a little bit more uh, uh, formal tabulation in this paper by Foley and Gamble, uh, looking at the summary of uh, the ecological basis for and social consequences of the five transitions in hominin evolution uh, that they discuss in their paper. So they list five transitions uh, like bipedalism, range size, fission and fusion with the timing, uh, obviously before uh, uh, the transition to modern human. So ecological change involved where terrestrial and longer uh, ranging distances, uh, transition of uh, vegetation in East Africa with aridification. Social implications included more dispersed social communities and greater fission and fusion, so cultural coming together and separations. Key structural shifts in human social evolution included fission and fusion. Uh, hominin taxon with derived social behavior, Australopithecines, uh, this is a speciation, so this jump from uh, the great apes to this uh, early hominin taxon uh, happened around that time. So this again assumes implicitly uh, and explicitly that ecological changes uh, had social implications and structural shifts and uh, social evolution and maybe even speciation. So this is somewhat along uh, many other people's work including uh, <coughs> Axel Timmerman's work we looked at in terms of habit habit suitability indices, habitat suitability indices. The second transition around 2.6 to 1.6 million years ago, so we went from what was considered a permanent El Nino-like temperature in the tropical Pacific, which would lead to a lot of rain over East Africa and lush green forests, a lot of hiding places, easy availability of food, uh, and so on to aridification and Pleistocene glaciation cycles. Uh, so tools and meat uh, happened here. Ecological changes included greater access to animal resources, so technology, more reliable food supply, smoothing of seasonal variation, and social implications included more prolonged male-female bonding, so begin to have uh, monogamous family life, increased fertility, and male-female relationships got affected, and early homo lineage happened as a speciation from Australopithecines. Okay? So we already saw that modern DNA mix was already uh, here. Uh, the others include fire families and focus, social brains and technologies, projectiles like spears, ecological intensification, so changes in diet, uh, resources, uh, energy rich ecology to fish eating, uh, harvesting already would have started around here because we are already coming into uh, the Holocene. So other social uh, transitions here, uh, intergroup and regional social structures, networks, uh, male controls of resources and thus female distribution. So the current version of the Me Too uh, movement had origins way back when, uh, when males realized controlling resources gave them certain control. Uh, of course, it involved uh, who did the hunting and gathering and uh, collecting resources and who did the child tending, uh, giving children time to develop and grow and so on and so forth. So nested hierarchical, hierarchical community structures to explore it, fission fusion and supra community structures, uh, regional social systems and networks, social structure dominated by resource ownership and defense and control. So here tribes begin to grow with uh, communities growing, population growing, then the idea of tribal chief, power by uh, 
what is called tributary power. Maybe he was good at hunting and controlling meat and resources and sharing to get tributary power as opposed to power by consent now where let's say we have elections in democracies where we vote and give consensual uh, consensual power to somebody and then they become crazy and do crazy things like start wars or uh, corruption and so on and so forth. So went from Homo heidelbergensis into Homo helmi, Neanderthalensis and Sapiens. Of course we had Erectus, Habilis and so on, Devonians, Floresiensis etc. as well. And Homo sapiens became dominant around this time, especially with the 65,000 year uh, jump uh, in technology and so on. Okay, so I will leave this here and come back and talk in a little bit more detail about what is kind of accepted as far as uh, modern human brain is concerned. So we won't answer whether uh, brain remains uh, uh, something that you uh, inherit genetically some abilities but uh, how you use it determines a lot of what you end up doing with it in life. So it's a strange combination of um, imprinted information that uh, gives you edge or makes you handicapped in some way. Plus there are ways in which you can use it and grow it. It's a muscle so you can strengthen it in various ways and you constantly see uh, brain uh, smart food, you see exercises for the brain and there is a lot of evidence that as you grow older using the brain can help avoid things like Alzheimer's uh, and so on, like reading a lot or using multiple languages full time and so on and so forth prevents development of plaque on the brain and so on. So brain and behavioral uh, advances and uh, adaptations or adaptability and uh, evolution are kind of uh, very tough to separate from genetically ordained, preordained kind of inherited uh, characteristics versus what can become uh, almost Lamarckian that you uh, seek changes uh, with language acquisition, education, uh, behavioral changes, migrations and so on and whether they get transmitted to your children uh, of course remains uh, still an open question. So we'll come back and discuss that a little bit in uh, the next podcast. Okay.